Welcome back, everyone. What a great start to the morning we've had. Um, I'm here to introduce our next panel, panel and the moderator of that panel, uh, that's titled Innovation in the U.S. Envisioning the Future, is Dr. William Wolfe. Dr. Wolfe is a university professor and AT&T professor of engineering in the computer science department at the University of Virginia. Uh, from 1996 until 2007, he served as president of the National Academy of Engineering. Very pleased and uh, has agreed to serve as moderator today. Uh, please welcome Dr. Wolf. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, it's a little intimidating to be following the previous panel, but uh, aside from that, um, I guess I thought I'd draw attention to something Lee Hamilton said about Woodrow Wilson, and that was um, his really extraordinary conjunction of scholarship and policy. And uh, we don't see that in our political system very often. Um, on the other hand, it's been mentioned several times this morning that uh, Steve Chu is going to be named as the next Secretary of Energy. Uh, it's also been the, the report from the Academy's Rising Above the Gathering Storm, which, by the way, we call the RAGS report. <laughs> Rising Above the Gathering Storm. Yes, well, anyway, uh, that's been mentioned several times. Nobody has mentioned that Steve was on the RAGS committee. Um, and so I am hopeful now that we will have somebody at a, at a high level in the administration who really understands at a very visceral level just how important um, this whole issue of innovation is, and I hope understands how urgent it is to do something about it. Um, it is not as though the rest of the world is just sitting back and waiting for us to move ahead on this. Um, I spent last weekend in Berlin at a workshop of the von Humboldt uh, foundation, where the subject was innovation, the RAGS report, um, and what Germany needs to do to move ahead. But they're not moving a heck of a lot faster than we are. Let me uh, report to you an experience that I had, and it's burned into my brain, on June the 5th, 2006. I was in Beijing. I was there for the annual meeting of the Chinese National Academy of Engineering and National Academy of Sciences, uh, the opening session of which was held in the Great Hall of the People, their, their congressional building, uh, the, the floor of which I now know seats 3,000 people. There were about 12 of us foreigners. Uh, so there I was in the midst of 2,988 of the best scientists and engineers in China. But the astonishing thing was who was on the da dais. It was the President of China, the Prime Minister of China, and every single member of the Politburo. Um, the President of China, President Hu, gave the uh, keynote address, the subject of which was what we need to do to make China into an innovation-driven country. And it was like he was reading from the RAGS report. Um, it was intellectual property protection. It was the rule of law. It was education. It was research. Um, it was scary. Because as I sat there, I couldn't help but think, at that point, we hadn't passed the Competes Act yet, so we didn't have either authorization or appropriation, and everybody who was needed to make it happen in China was sitting on that dais, and the heads were all going like this. Um, I, I just want to underscore, I think there is great urgency in getting on with it, uh, for, in particular providing appropriation. The purpose of this panel is to kick off the, the substance of this, this uh, workshop, um, in particular to start a dialogue with you. And so, in fact, I've, 
I have asked each of the panelists to speak for just about five minutes, and then we're going to devote the bulk of the time to engaging in a dialogue about innovation, about the relationship of that to partnering between academia, industry, the national laboratories, and beginning the conversation about what are the next steps. Um, the panelists that I have, I, I will briefly introduce now because you have uh, a more elaborate biography of each of them uh, in the handout that you received. But Deborah Wintz Smith is the CEO of uh, the Council on Competitiveness. Bob Birdall is the president of the Association of American Universities, uh, previously chancellor of the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, Britt Kerwin is the chancellor of the University of Maryland system. And unfortunately, Josh Wolf is stuck in an airport someplace. Uh, so he will not be with us. That's too bad. Uh, his perspective as managing partner of Lux Capital would have been um, very useful. We've tried to give assignments uh, to each of the speakers this morning so that we don't get too much overlap, although I think probably each of them is uh, more than capable of speaking on the full range of issues uh, to be discussed. But I'm just going to turn it now over to uh, Deborah for her comments. Thank you, thank you Bill. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the changing global landscape and then just what that means to the United States in terms of our competitiveness and innovation and creation of prosperity. And as we like to say at the Council in Competitiveness, we're in an age of great turbulence, transition, and transformation. And as, as Bill said, and we know from all the work we're doing in, in this room that the uh, world has irrevocably changed. And in addition, you know, to the recognition throughout the world of the importance of science and technology and innovation, you know, the power of the emerging economies has just, you know, in less than 10 years really become a major force, not only in manufacturing, but also as innovation players. It's something that is good for the world, but it's one that has big implications for the United States. And, you know, Bill, I have to comment. You mentioned about the, the China situation, the gathering storm, and, you know, some of you remember the Council's work, the National Innovation Initiative. A good thing coming out of our work, actually, is that there are now national innovation initiatives all over the world, from Turkey and Egypt to Brazil, uh, India, of course, the EU and the Nordic. So the U.S. model is one that everyone's looking at, but at the same time, it poses challenges for us. A couple trends just to quickly throw out. Um, you know, this whole issue about how do we compete. We can't compete on low wage and standardized products and commodities. For the first time in human history, we have 24-7 real-time labor arbitrage. Um, we have globally uh, integrated enterprises now, no longer multinationals. Um, there's a great book, if you haven't read it, called Globality that came out of the University of Chicago. And the title is, you know, everyone, everywhere is competing all the time for everything. <laughs> and, you know, that's the reality. We're kind of beyond globalization. Um, and one of the other very important transformational shifts, in addition to, you know, the issue of who does work where and where high value investment goes, is that manufacturing and services have actually merged and where the value in that uh, continuum is really very great importance to the United States. And the real value, we have the data on this at the Council, is the incredible value of intangible assets that are now three times that of tangible assets. This is everything from intellectual property to brand and marketing know-how, the case of the financial world, to trust. The lack of trust, that intangible assets, had a huge impact on the current situation we find ourselves in. So, you know, we can't replicate the advantages of emerging economies. We can't compete with China and India on how many scientists and, and, and technologists they train. We have to have a whole new roadmap for how Americans are educated and how we're going to flourish in a society and a world where ideas and innovation matter. And who knows what to do with the new knowledge and technology once it's developed? And who can capture that benefit? And the deployment issue is huge, and I know we're going to talk about that. Um, a couple thoughts I just want to say on, you know, the scope of innovation is really so much beyond now hardware and processes and physical things. Um, you know, you look at the entertainment world. I, I just recently met a, a young man who's doing some things at the Redskins, and they have this incredible 
football game that's a training exercise that's using high performance computing and gaming. It's an incredible example of innovation. And I don't know how many of us in the room would even know that in the sports world, in the entertainment world, so much of the innovation that's out of the traditional science and technology is driving so many of our uh, new transformations. Um, let me just say also that, and we're going to talk about this, I know, but in terms of innovation, you know, we've all talked for so many years about the importance of the multidisciplinary nature, where the value comes. Um, this, of course, is true, whether it's biomimicry, I mean, all the fields, we know this, and that this merger of the digital nano um, biotechnology revolutions are going to just rewrite the world. But if you look at the data, and I have this, I won't go into it here, the National Science Foundation, our R&D investment is still very much skewed to the old way of doing research. Single investigators in departments. And I think that with the new administration, that's going to be a great opportunity to really change not just the numbers in terms of our investment, but where it goes and how we bring in these strategic partnerships. Um, I am one of the people who's pushed for many years, uh, some of you know I'm an archaeologist, that we have to have engineers who think like artists and artists who think like um, engineers. And we have to bring in the arts, humanities, and social sciences with our science and technology enterprise. And I, I have to plug this since I have a son who's a plebe at the Naval Academy. I've learned that there are only two universities, and I want my colleagues to refute this, but there are only two universities, I think, in our country that have the curriculum for the 21st century, and that's Annapolis and West Point. Why? By design, every student there has to have arts, humanities, social sciences, but guess what? They all end up with an engineering degree. They end up with an engineering degree, but they have all of that other knowledge and innovation thinking that's important for the future. I hope we'll have a chance to talk a little bit um, about the Council's new competitiveness agenda uh, that we released on November 12th. Uh, compete bonds, compete pass, compete next, and compete energy. On the energy side, uh, I think that given the financial situation, the stimulus, what we have to do to get our economy and unleash the industrial capacity of the nation going, that we really need to target and think very strategically of how our R&D investments can really be harnessed for these grand challenges in the energy renewable space, you know, really moving to the uh, carbon-free environment that we know um, really our, our future prosperity depends on. So with that, let me turn it over to my colleague. I think, mm -hmm. who's that, Bob? Bob? Yeah, I think I have a have mic it. that's um, hooked up, so I'll uh, just um, speak without the hand, the hand mic. Um, first of all, let me say how pleased I am to be here and that AAU is uh, very pleased to be a co-sponsor of this event. I want to especially acknowledge the work that my colleague Toby Smith has done on this, uh, and uh, we're very delighted to be here. The, uh, everyone seems to be quoting Woodrow Wilson. As you know, he had 14 points. I'll try not to have so many uh, <laughs> if I'm going to get it done in five minutes. I, I think something that Congressman Biggert mentioned this morning about wishing there were another Sputnik, uh, because that so shocked uh, the American people, uh, and it shocked us into action. Um, it uh, is the case, it seems to me, that some of the the competition that was much less real with Sputnik uh, than it is today is nevertheless very real today and not quite as obvious as it was during Sputnik. So uh, I, I do think we've got to uh, be very much aware of uh, what is out there. I want to just make three uh, points, some of which have already been made and indeed it isn't easy to say anything particularly new on, on the subject of innovation since we have all been thinking and talking about it for a long time and our thoughts tend to converge. Um, I, I would say first of all that there's a, it's a kind of important truism that uh, political, uh, our, a nation's political and economic agenda is primary in establishing its educational agenda. Uh, and not the reverse. The education agenda tends to reflect the economic and political agenda of a country and not shape it. 
Uh, and as an educator, I, I, I think that this is something we should remind ourselves because it hasn't um, always been the case and I don't think that it necessarily is completely the case today that our goals economically uh, in terms of innovation are indeed completely shaping our educational uh, agenda. Just one case in point, the average age of an R01 grant from NIH is now 42. Uh, and when one thinks about the investment of time that a young scientist uh, in the life sciences uh, makes going through a PhD program, going through uh, several postdocs, perhaps uh, obtaining an assistant professorship at uh, at a university, making him or her eligible to apply for for an in, for a grant, uh, they are average age of 42 when they receive that first grant. Uh, that tends to be somewhat discouraging, it seems to me, to an entry into a career in the life sciences uh, if one is uh, almost halfway to retirement before one is an independent investigator. Uh, it's much faster, or has been, I would say, a much faster road to riches to become an investment banker. Uh, the bloom <laughs> may be off that rose, um, but, uh, but it is, it seems to me, uh, something that does reflect what our priorities are. When I think about the current crisis, for example, right now, with the, uh, the, the falling endowments that universities have, the cutback in state investment in public universities, one of the major concerns that I have is that we will, we run the risk of losing several cohorts of, of young scientists seeking academic careers. Uh, senior faculty are not retiring. Their retirement portfolios have shrunk considerably. Uh, universities are facing cutbacks and are cutting back their hiring or in some cases freezing it. The combination of these convergent forces uh, means that we're going to have uh, several years or several cohort groups of young scientists seeking um, academic careers and not being able to find positions at universities uh, for them. Uh, if this is a high priority for us, it seems to me as we think about uh, a stimulus package, we have to think about those kinds of jobs uh, as well and not simply uh, jobs, uh, for example, in, in the construction realm or somewhere else. The second thing that I would uh, point out, and I think Deborah has mentioned this so I won't uh, stress it uh, terribly much, and that is the innovation is not a linear evolution. It doesn't just simply go from a, an idea and a development in a laboratory to, a, to an end user product uh, when some company picks it up or some uh, a young scientist decides to turn it into uh, a, a, an investment and a, an end user project, product. Uh, technology, uh, as technology develops a convergence of, of, uh, of disciplines and end product users happens. Uh, one need only to look, for example, at the automobile, which I'm told today, and I don't know this for a fact, has more computers than uh, the early uh, space vehicles had. Uh, that computer technology uh, embedded in automobiles is largely done in Japan. Uh, I don't think we were in the forefront of that, that technology, but it was a convergence of the electronics industry and the emerging automobile industry that Japan had. Uh, and so that it was that that enabled a lot of that innovation to take place. And one could make the same argument about digital technology and visual displays leading to, uh, for example, uh, cameras uh, that, uh, digital cameras, that uh, those converging technologies that Japan developed uh, have basically put American manufacturers out of uh, the digital camera business. This suggests that there is in this convergence certainly the importance of 
what Deborah has referred to as the multidisciplinary approach or an appreciation for uh, different kinds of, of thinking about how innovation takes place and how it is applied. Uh, and in those partnerships that we develop between uh, industry, universities, national laboratories, uh, I, I think we have to think about that interdisciplinarity as well uh, and not simply about the role of science and technology. One Im interesting data point, and I don't know how it will work out, is that the new university, Kaust University in Saudi Arabia, in which the royal family is investing so much money uh, to develop a world-class university in very short order, and it will be, I think, the second most richly endowed university when it is up and running, behind only Harvard and Yale, uh, and given the current investments, maybe ahead of them, uh, it, it will have no academic departments. Uh, so that, that that kind of effort at uh, convergent thinking is at least being experimented with in that university setting. The third point that I'd make is that uh, innovation requires coherent policy objectives uh, really across the spectrum of, uh, uh, of our uh, entire policy apparatus. Uh, I would really pose the question as to whether or not we have uh, a coherent industrial innovation policy in this country. Um, whether we have tax legislation that encourages long-term investment. Um, we talked, for example, this morning, one of, the, one of the topics was the fluctuation in oil prices and whether or not when oil prices drop, we lose the incentive to uh, conserve or uh, to develop new technologies and so forth. Think where we might have been today if we had sustained oil prices from the 1970s by simply maintaining a tax. Uh, on them. Taxation isn't very popular with politicians. Uh, it isn't easy to pass a tax. Um, but it does seem to me that um, we very well could have um, pushed ourselves with that kind of tax policy from the 1970s onward into more innovative thinking about how we conserved energy uh, if it was a little more expensive and, uh, and, and the price didn't drop but down again as it has now, and, and why we aren't thinking about that now as a part of a coherent policy, uh, it seems to me is, is, is a serious question uh, that we should ask. In that coherent policy as well, I have to say, I think universities have to play a role in rethinking their attitudes. Uh, by Dole was not passed as a revenue source for universities. It was passed as a an effort to get technology out of universities into, uh, into products and into end use uh, kinds of things. But I think universities have come to see it as a revenue source and that has presented, as I suspect Susan Butts will tell us uh, later, something of an obstacle to negotiating those intellectual property uh, arrangements that are, that are necessary. I think universities have got to change their thinking uh, about this. We could go, we've talked about immigration policy as, as well uh, this morning uh, and so forth, but I think that we have to think about this entire range of things in an integrated fashion and I'm not sure we've been doing that. And with that I'll pass uh, the remarks on. Okay. Well, um, let me also express appreciation for the opportunity to in, in, engage in, in, in this topic and uh, um, I, I uh, bef as a kind of a prelude to my uh, comments, I want to pick up on uh, something that uh, Deborah began to touch on and actually triggered by something that Bill said. Um, uh, I was in, I've been involved, and in, there was actually a report released yesterday uh, with a commission uh, formed by the College Board to sort of look at the state of education in America and where we are and where, what we need to do. Uh, looking forward, and I, I couldn't help but think about how uh, the information in that report is in some ways relevant uh, uh, to the topic we're having right now. We have such a crisis in America uh, with the state of education, and when you think about the long-term 
economic viability of our nation, uh, you know, this has, this has very significant consequences. Uh, you know, it's just a few, a few facts. Uh, we, we're 23rd among industrialized nations in, in, the, in the high school completion rate in the U.S. We are 10th in college completion rates. We have the large, highest dropout rate in college of any industrialized uh, nation. Uh, we, we right now educate uh, about 40% about of our 25 to 34 year old population has a two or four year degree, which is lower percentage than the 35 to 44 year old cohort. So we're going in the wrong direction. Meanwhile, many countries uh, have uh, 45, 50, 55 percent of their population with a, 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 a two or, or, or four year degree. Given the demographics of our country and the uh, participation and sec success rate of underrepresented m minorities, underrepresented in higher education. If we do nothing, in 2025, 29% of our young adults will have a college degree uh, as opposed to 40 today. We will have gone in the lifetime of the people in this room mm -hmm. from having the highest level of college attainment in the, in, in, in the world to the lowest among uh, the industrialized world unless something changes. That's the track we're on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard, kind of hard to talk about uh, uh, being a, a, an innovative society if we continue on that path. But an, a, enough about that. Let me, let me turn to the, directly to the, uh, to the topic uh, uh, to, of today. And, 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 and I want to focus on something that uh, Bob began, uh, you know, t touched on a little bit, but I want to uh, 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 burrow in and, and speak specifically about our federal labs. Uh, because, in, in, in my opinion, this is a huge untapped uh, resource for our country when it comes to innovation. Now, there is the, the, the results of innovation in the federal lab do make their way into, uh, into our economy but not nearly at the uh, rate and extent that they, they probably should. Uh, just by way of comparison, we, we spend about $20 billion a year on federally sponsored R&D in our colleges and universities in the United States. And you know, that R&D really becomes the source for innovation uh, that grows out of our uh, university, the technology transfer, the startups, et cetera. We actually spend the same amount of money on federal labs. So, uh, you know, there is an opportunity here, $20 billion of R&D being done at, at our federal labs. But we have not had a, a, a sort of consistent national policy on, uh, on, on how to tap into that, uh, to that R&D. So I, I, there, there are a couple of thoughts I'd just like to throw out. Uh, uh, one is there are, there are of course, uh, ex uh, many existing labs, and uh, a number of them are co-located or located near uh, uh, u universities. Uh, I think of in the state of Maryland. We have uh, the, the, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, sitting next door to the University of Maryland Biotechnology Institute. <coughs> Well, they have found, formed a very highly integrated research partnership. We've got NIST uh, scientists working within UMBI and UMBI's scientists over in NIST space. And, 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 and so that, that's not sort of you know, breaking down the walls between the government labs and, and, the, uh, uh, and the universities is, I think, uh, a, a very important uh, th th thing for us to, uh, to do. Um, but I think there's uh, also uh, the possibility, I mean, we do have uh, sort of an embedded uh, infrastructure of, 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 of national labs, but as we develop uh, new national uh, laboratories, we ought to make a conscious effort to locate them near major uh, research universities. Uh, uh, we, a, a good example of that is uh, uh, NOAA has just uh, uh, announced the, uh, the creation of a huge new research uh, program in uh, climate change. And guess where they've located their la laboratory? On the research park at the University of Maryland. And so our space scientists, our atmospheric scientists, our environmental people will be right there next door in, in, integrated with 
uh, this new uh, this uh, new NOAA uh, center. So you know, I, I think as a, as, a, as a national policy, as we grow these government labs, it, it, they ought to be consciously directed to uh, uh, the, the, the the synergy and the partnership with, with our uh, universities. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if the time hasn't come for uh, the creation of some sort of entity that will be focused on the commercialization of intellectual property created within our, our, our federal labs. I mean, why couldn't we create a, a, a federally charted, charted federal technology commercialization entity that worked with our federal labs, sort of on the model of what, uh, let's say, the uh, WARF, the Wisconsin uh, uh, Research Foundation, uh, has done for the University of, uh, uh, of, of Wisconsin. This is actually an idea that has been put forth by uh, a group called, uh, the, uh, familiar to many of you, I'm sure, the Association of University Research Parks. Uh, this, is a, this is a notion that, uh, that they are p promoting and uh, uh, I think uh, is, is worthy of discussion. I want to mention one other uh, thing that is uh, we're, we're doing in Maryland that is sort of sort of an experiment, and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether it pays the kind of dividends uh, that that I, I hope it will. We have gotten um, a, a grant from the Department of, of Defense uh, to set up a um, a statewide resource to promote uh, university government lab. Uh, commercialization of uh, intellectual uh, property, and what this what this entity entity is going to be is is going to be sort of a one stop resource for the federal labs and the universities in in, in Maryland, including uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, the private institution, uh, and 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 the idea is here that this this would be a service available to uh, labs and universities that would 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 provide um, uh, technology assessment, it would provide uh, legal services, it would provide uh, uh, the help uh, inventors, uh, research uh, researchers uh, to develop business plans, and to provide consultation on uh, technology transfer and, and, and license, licensing consultation. But this, this, this grant is, is very much uh, 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 focused on not just the universities and the academic research, but also the intellectual pro property that is being uh, created in, in the federal lab. So I just wanted to throw out, maybe it's been discussed earlier today, but I just wanted to uh, place some em emphasis on, uh, in addition to our universities, I, I think there are uh, tremendous opportunities to to uh, promote innovation and uh, uh, e economic uh, economic growth by drawing upon this incredible wealth of uh, intellectual property at our federal labs. So, Bill, I'll turn it back okay. to you. Okay, uh, I'm going to exercise the uh, the privilege of the gavel. Uh, I'd like to tie together two things that that Bob and Britt um, discussed uh, that happened to tickle a particular. Uh, annoyance of mine. Um, Bob pointed out that policy is a reflection of society. And uh, there's a particular reflection that I am disturbed about. Um, if we go back a hundred years, um, it's very clear that the population of the United States considered higher education a public good. We created the land-grant universities. States generously supported their universities. I certainly went to college on scholarships um, at a time when the tuition was $200 a semester uh, because the state supported the University of Illinois very generously. We have moved into a realm where higher education is now viewed as a private good. Um, at the University of Virginia, 7% of the revenues of the university come from the state, 7%. Uh, our tuition is now still cheap relative to Harvard or MIT, but it's $12,000, $13,000 a year. 
Um, we guarantee loans, but give very few scholarships. All, I think, reflecting this shift from the view of higher education as a public good to that of a private good. And I think a lot of the data that, that Britt was, was giving us is also a reflection of that same shift in attitude. And I think it's a terrible. So now let me open it up for, for questions. Uh, let's get a dialogue going. Yes. Deborah, you brought up the, the point of multidisciplinary teams in conducting research and the need for, you know, students to be trained in that way, which I agree with quite, quite vehemently. But the challenge you have at the universities, and please the two faculty people up here, correct me if I'm wrong, is that at a university a professor is rated to get tenure based on his individual research and his individual publications and his graduate students. So how do we, you know, in looking at creating stronger partnerships, how do we enable that by reducing some of the constraints that are placed on young faculty? I mean, we, I work at a national lab. We get a lot of young people there coming into the labs, but we don't have that problem so they're not getting tenure. We hire them. They have a job. But if they're looking at teaching at a university, you know, their number one concern is how do I get tenure? And so how do you change this paradigm within the university system? to enable these multidisciplinary teams and actually accelerate innovation at the universities? Well, I'll defer um, on some of that to my colleagues who, you know, have led universities or in the leadership of the university world, but just commenting from the competitiveness side and also, you know, looking at the broader economy. And, and I've had a lot of experience and involvement with the federal labs, and, and I very much endorse the comments that, that both my colleagues made about including um, the federal labs in this very powerful infrastructure of what we want to accomplish. But one interesting thing about the federal labs, um, they are by design multidisciplinary because they're working on problems that, you know, require chemists, biologists, you know, the whole range of things. And they have very interesting management systems of how they matrix that expertise in. So I know, for instance, at Livermore, they'll have an, a, an engineering directorate and you'll belong to that but you'll be matrixed out to work on the next ignition facility or whatever huge project it is. And so they keep the depth of their disciplinary expertise growing, but then it's amplified by working in multidisciplinary teams. And, you know, that's a very different mission that they're doing than the core teaching and, and basic research that's so important in our universities. But I'll throw something out controversial. I was just kind of whispering to, to Bill here. You know, look what's going on in our economy. I mean, look what's happening to every industry. I mean, I, I just have had talks with three CEOs of the council. I mean, look at what companies are doing. They're downsizing. They're letting people go. Massive restructuring. What's happening in the auto industry? Is this environment that we're in now calling for serious restructuring in universities? How people are rewarded? Is tenure something that is a long-term viability model? I don't know. but. You know, this is a huge part of our economy, and it's stressed, the tuition stressed. And, and I'll just share one anecdote, um, and I won't mention which state this is, but a colleague of mine told this story. She went to a very important state with a fabulous university system for a discussion on the college, you know, admissions process. And the head of that system said to the parents, it's great for you to be here, but I want you to know less than one-fourth of your students of, of your children will get into our universities because we are elite global universities. And apparently there was almost a riot in the room <laughs> and people said, why are we paying taxes if there's no chance that our kids can get in? So there's a lot of complexity on this issue of public support and everything. But back to your core question, you have to change the incentive system. And I, I think, again, uh, Britt and Bob and, have, have led universities and you know the complexity of it and the governance system. Well, well, Deborah, I just want to uh, reassure everyone, I wasn't that system head. No, you say weren't. That, so, uh, if you were, I wouldn't have told the story. The problem is, I might have been. <laughs> you would have remembered the riot in the room, but I was... <laughs> you, you, you know, I, I think the, the question is, is very well uh, put and, and, and very, very appropriate. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think the... Uh, the that, U universities, uh, of course, don't change uh, v very quickly. Change at university is measured in, 
you know, at glacial speed, I guess, is the one, way one, we, one grave at a time. One grave at, <laughs> at, at, a time, at, at, at a time. But I do think um, that uh, some things are happening that uh, are leading to some reconsideration of structure and, and um, means of promoting inter interdisciplinary act activity for a, a number of, of several reasons. First of all, as, as Bob knows well, uh, so many of the large research grants now that go to institutions demand inter interdisciplinary activity. So universities, in order to, to maintain their research, are having to bring together teams from, from across, the, across the institution. And this is forcing them to begin to look anew at how rewards the uh, at, at the reward structures. Now, whether it will lead to some reconsideration of of, of tenure, Deborah, I rather doubt. But uh, I do think that we're going to see some uh, progress on the very point that uh, you made. Let me just give one example, and I'm sure Bob has other things to say on this this subject. But um, I'm happen to be. I was mentioning to Bob. I'm, I'm chairing the reaccreditation team for UCLA, which is one of America's great research uh, u universities. And uh, when, for those of you who aren't involved in this esoteric uh, process, when universities like UCLA are, are, are reviewed for reaccreditation, they put some major issue they're interested in working on on the table for uh, scrutiny, investigation, and new strategies. And, and the thing that UCLA put on the table uh, is how do we reorganize ourselves in order to manage and promote and reward interdisciplinary activity. That's great. Oh. This is the, the issue at UCLA. That's you know, great. here's this great university that, uh, uh, but it's put that issue on, on the table. And uh, I think that's happening at other, other places. But I think we're all going to learn from uh, the, the models that uh, come out of places uh, like UCLA who seem to be taking this subject on with a real vengeance. Well, I, I, I think that what you said is absolutely true. Uh, we announced, while well, I was chancellor at Berkeley, uh, what we called a health science initiative. We don't have a medical school at Berkeley, uh, but we recognize that, that the disciplines that were represented on the campus had, were doing a great deal of research that had bearing on disease and on health. Uh, and we had uh, roughly 300 faculty from I don't remember how many dozens of disciplines that uh, became aligned with this. This also then dictates how facilities are built so that the new facilities that are being built on most university campuses today are not disciplinary buildings. They are buildings that comprise uh, many, many different disciplines. The integration of the physical sciences and the life sciences is is really a, a very, very strong uh, tendency. You can't do uh, biology today without strong computational capacities. So there, there is, I think, a very, very um, powerful integration that is happening on university campuses. I'm not sure we, we do move with such glacial speed. I think that that um, the the issues that we um, that we confront are recognized as all having multidisciplinary components, so that uh, it is changing a great deal about how we do research. Now, just apropos the comment that that Deborah made, and it, it may very well have been the University of California. I, it wasn't, uh, uh, but <laughs> it, it could have been because at Berkeley we admitted only one out of uh, four in-state applicants and about one out of 12 out-of-state applicants. Uh, and that, it, it, the University of California, by, its, uh, by the system of higher education, uh, every student graduating in the top 12.5% of their high school class was eligible for admission to the University of California and was, at least at that time, provided a place on one of the campuses. But the campuses were competitive in their admissions, and it meant that only uh, roughly the top three or four percent got admitted uh, to Berkeley, uh, or one out of twenty-five uh, app or w one out of four applicants that that got admitted to Berkeley. This is a very hard political problem. The cons the problem is, however, um, that uh, the the state now is running out of space 
uh, it, at its universities, it will not be able to, in the long run, admit one out of every student out of the top 12 and a half percent. Uh, and 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 that is the consequence of uh, of what of the priorities of the state, but it's also a consequence of a lot of other factors that are impinging. I mean, the largest sin single uh, investment uh, in the state is is I think Medicaid. Uh, you've got the growth of Medicaid. You've got uh, you know in its great wisdom, California passed a three strikes a year out. Uh, and you're out uh, law which uh, created a wonderful growth industry in prisons uh, so that they now spend more on prisons than they do on higher education in the state of California. Um, so that the competing state, the competition for state dollars is, is very, very keen and it's one of, the, one of the things that is making it difficult for access, it's one of the things that's driving up tuition rates yeah. Uh, and is resulting, I think, nationwide in some of the, the reasons for the data, the very discouraging data that Britt uh, introduced his remarks with about a declining percentage of our young people going, to, uh, going on to higher education. Well, you know, it, it ties, Bill, to what you were saying about t treating uh, higher education as a, uh, a private uh, uh, good. You know, I, I think it was 19, 2005 uh, was on a, a state investment per FTE student in higher education, adjusted for inflation, was at an all-time low all-time low. So it just, it just picks up the, the, the point you're making. In California, uh, as Bob knows, the institutions are having a massive uh, a budget cut. They're actually restricting their enrollment now. So at the very time when our nation needs to be educating more, more people, uh, we're universities are, you know, what they're left with, they're going to raise tuition so they can cover the cost of educating students, or they're going to restrict enrollment. So th this issue of uh, uh, the, the, the public good versus the private uh, is, uh, is so very important. Yeah. Let's get some of the audience involved yeah. here. Hi, I'm Rick Stulin from uh, Sandia National Labs. Thanks very much for your comments. I want to follow up on a, a comment that Senator Bringerman made this morning and tie it into one of the themes that's come out here. Uh, the senator said sort of a key question here is how can the government incentivize partnerships? You know, how can the government incentivize partnerships? You've talked about the national laboratories or the federal laboratories as being an untapped resource. In fact, we have over 20,000 scientists and engineers eager, I believe, right. to, to play their role in this national uh, agenda. What do you believe, if you look at this picture, would be sort of high priority government actions or policies that would uh, enable us to really tap into the national laboratories in collaboration with the universities and so forth. And do you see those elements, in fact, in the American Competes legislation, or are, in fact, there still some gaps that we ought to be worrying about? So how can we do this? Bob, you're probably more familiar with the American Competes legislation. Are there incentives for uh, collaboration? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Deborah, you may know this better than I. I'm not sure there are incentives of the kind in this legislation that you're talking about because there are clearly commitments to uh, expanded STEM education at, and, and uh, investment in, in efforts on schools, uh, clearly uh, greater investments in the physical sciences by the federal government, but I'm not sure there are incentives in it for the kind of collaboration that you're that you're talking about. Uh, there may be aspects of it that I'm not aware of, and there are uh, others in the room who know America Competes uh, Act um, in greater detail than I do. But Deborah, you may have an answer to that question. No, more there, but there are other places, you know, in the legislative process, but even in what agencies are doing now, and that I think will accelerate. That is is really driving these partnerships. And again, you know, I made the comment if you. Think of the large-scale problems the country has to deal with and how the science and technology enterprise will be the solution path. That really gives you the mantra for how to build these partnerships. And, you know, I see Dan Arvizu, the director of Enroll back there. I mean, what they're doing on energy efficiency and renewables with industry, with universities, with labs, is the only way they, they can advance that mission. 
And so I think we have a fabulous opportunity to really think about how do we create a network of test beds around some of these problems that bring together these three players. And another area where we're talking about the tools of science, the tools of industry, how we're going to revolutionize manufacturing in this country is modeling and simulation as the third leg of all of this. Where does that capability reside? It resides in our national labs, it resides in our universities, there's some industry users. And again, how we could bring together the partnerships, um, and many of them are underway, to make that a competitive advantage that this country has is a fantastic opportunity. And as I said, this is underway. What we need to do now is look at these models and practices and accelerate them and push them out. Because quite frankly, no other country in the world has that infrastructure and already the culture to do it. So in many ways, we're ahead of the game of any place in the world. It's our advantage. You know, I think one uh, thing is, is uh, providing, and I get, think this happens to, to some extent now, some joint funding that brings together teams from the labs and the universities. We have a great example at, at College Park of a joint quantum physics laboratory that is a partnership between scientists at uh, NIST and the College Park uh, campus looking at uh, quantum computing. And uh, it, it's part of the NIST mission because that's what they do, uh, they, uh, 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 the technology assessment and, 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 and computing. And, 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 and so, you know, I think that is a, a step in the right direction. I, ha I don't know what the federal restrictions are at the moment, but I have a, a very close friend who worked at a federal lab here in this region um, who was a, an inventor and uh, invented a number of devices that ultimately got uh, into the private sector and became uh, commercially viable. He could not receive one penny of royalty uh, at that time. I don't know if that's changed or not. But uh, uh, oh, no, not true now? No, okay, not that's many changed. Years. Good. Because, many but, years. But, but he actually left the, the, the laboratory, and, but it, it, yeah. the policies now permit much like they do with, at universities. Is that correct? That, that's in the actual federal tech okay. transfer legislation right. that we're all issuing. All right. Kevin? Hi, I'm Kevin Finneran with Issues in Science and Technology. Um, I've heard several of you talk in, in glowing and inspiring terms about what's involved in innovation and what a rich and complex process it is. And I wonder if getting a physicist at Maryland to talk to a physicist at NIST is enough interdisciplinarity or getting um, you know, a physicist and a biologist at Berkeley to talk to one another. It seems to me, you, know, you do have to crawl before you walk, but shouldn't we be thinking in, in much richer and more you know, ambitious terms about what is needed to spur an innovation process that really keeps us ahead of a number of countries that are training very good engineers and very good scientists? Um, it seems to me we've got to do one better than that, and I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And I know I've heard you talk about it before, so I just wanted to <laughs> remind you um, that we, we, I we think ambitiously. I tried to make that point, Kevin. Maybe I didn't do it very well, but um, some of of you and my colleagues know this, this example of DreamWorks animation. If anybody has the DVD of Shrek 2, look at the trailer at the end of how they made the movie. Because there's nothing like it in the world, what they did. You could see in one room all the computer graphics people, the designers, the engineers, the technicians with these wild musicians, these artists, these anthropologists. They are thrown together it's a cauldron of creativity. And what came out, you know, the most advanced modeling and simulation in supercomputing in any movie industry, you know, and, and so you had human motion. All of that is what you're talking about. And, you know, Procter & Gamble, many companies are doing this inside their own, you know, they're, they're going out, they're, they're pulling these teams together. And I think it's going on in universities, too. Although I, I'm on the board of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, which is one of the two great museums in our country, and you know how modeling and simulations now looking at the ancient world is a cutting-edge field. And we were, had our meeting last week, and I said to some of the scientists, "Have you been over to talk to Joe Bordonia, who's a friend and colleague of many of ours?" They didn't know who he was, <laughs> and here they're all at the University of Pennsylvania. And I said, "You know, this is former deputy director of NSF, head of engineering." You know, you guys need to talk to him and come together and figure out how to do this. But it's hard. Bob or Britt, do you want to? Um, 
Brit. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, uh, many of the, the, the big issues uh, of the day are driving us in, in the direction uh, you just, you, you're, you're, you're uh, advocating. For example, I mean, the whole thing with climate change. You can't address climate change without biologists, without engineers, without physical scientists, without chemical scientists, without public policy uh, uh, folks. So I, you know, I think some of these big initiatives on, on, on climate change are creating this sort of rich array of, of, uh, of ex expertise. And you know, I think the, the, uh, the, all of this uh, uh, activity now around nanobiotechnology bio where you've got medical doctors working with electrical engineers, working with computer scientists, um, is, is another example of how uh, I, I think that the, the big important issues are breaking down these uh, uh, discipl disciplinary barriers and you know, bringing people from multiple discipl disciplines to uh, work, on, uh, work on issues. I'm Michael Lubell, and uh, I wear two hats. I'm a professor of physics at CCNY and director of public affairs at the American Physical Society. Uh, I would like to make a few comments. Number one, the issue of health care and Medicaid is, I think, the heart of the problem in the support of uh, higher education in state uh, institutions. And I think it's, an, it's also uh, the heart of one of the problems that American industry faces. And this, to me, is one of the central things that we have to address, because without that, I think we can't compete. Uh, but let me uh, move on to a couple of other issues. Uh, again, the, now I'll wear my university hat. I was department chair uh, for a number of years. And the issue is stovepiping. And it's fine to talk about interdisciplinary research, but the reality is that many provosts, when they start looking at individual departments and the support the departments will get, say, how many majors do you have? Now, departments, therefore, try to channel the kids into the majors so that they get the support. The same thing happens with faculty members. Uh, I, when I was uh, department chair, I wound up hiring 10 people. And one of the, we were looking for somebody in biophysics. And this guy came through, a terrific guy. His degree was in chemistry. And a number of my colleagues said, well, we can't hire him. He's a chemist. And we're a physics department. We eventually did hire him, incidentally. <laughs> but it was a big battle. The culture is still a stovepiped culture. And I think that's something that has to be broken down. Let me move on to two other issues, though. Uh, to me, it, the issue of, of technology transfer is important, but there's another issue that I think is equally important, and that is the question of how we value applied research. Uh, you get credit in a university if you do basic research. You get less credit if you do applied research in most places, if you're in one of the science departments. That's not necessarily true in engineering, but it is certainly true in the science disciplines. And as Vern Ehlers has pointed out, this is the valley of death. And I think that is one of our biggest problems in this country. We don't value it, at least in the academic circles. Uh, more, uh, we, we do more of that in the national laboratories. And I've, I've worked at three different national labs. But let me l end with one other comment. And that is if we are training people for, uh, for whom there are no jobs, we're not achieving anything. And I think we have to look at this system as an integrated whole. You can speak to a number of young scientists or engineers, and they'll say, biggest mistake I made in my life was spending all this time getting educated, and I can't get a job. And I think we have to look much more broadly. It involves things such as the R&D tax credit. It involves how we tax corporations. We need to have a much more holistic view of the system. Because otherwise, we're not going to get more people into it. We're not going to get the best and brightest. Uh, well, they won't go to Wall Street these days, but, you know, <laughs> they'll find something else. And I think this is really at the heart of it. Um, l let me just begin with a couple of comments, because I, I really uh, uh, agree with 
virtually everything that you said. Uh, I think that uh, clearly the health care issue is one of the issues that is also driving the cost of universities because they're employers and, and have to provide health care as well, and that's gone up double digits uh, for universities um, uh, every year. Uh, as far as the stovepipe culture, I, I think, interestingly enough, um, I, I think that's breaking down, but uh, where I saw this breaking down uh, the, the most, uh, uh, I, I think, substantially was uh, in, uh, in, in confronting the paucity of resources that some universities had to confront. Uh, I, I was, uh, began my administrative uh, career, I'm a historian by training, so I'm really an interloper here anyway. But uh, I uh, was a dean at the University of Oregon. The University of Oregon did not have much in the way of resources uh, as, as research universities go. And it had, however, a very strong um, uh, area in molecular biology uh, and a center in molecular biology. It didn't have much in the way of resources, and so it had to, it, it hired people regardless of field. Uh, it, was an inter, it was an interdisciplinary center, and they simply had to hire the very best person that they could possibly find, regardless of field, and put them in the center. And, 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 I, and, and, I, and I was struck by the fact that uh, another principle that they followed was that the last person hired, was, who was usually the youngest person on the faculty or the newest faculty member, had to serve on the search committee for the next person hired because they, uh, they, they recognized that these younger faculty were, uh, had, uh, uh, had a better sense of where the discipline was going in some respects than those that were embedded in it. So those were some principles that it seems to me universities can use to, to get around um, that stove piping issue. I agree with you about applied research. I think it has to be given greater recognition uh, in, in, in the process. I don't know what we do about training people for jobs that don't exist. I guess I don't agree quite with Deborah that everybody ought to be an engineer when they graduate from, uh, from the university. I, I agree too, but it's uh, a <laughs> I'm glad I don't have uh, to be one. Maybe as an historian. I, I, I was always struck that I had a, a large number of history majors that, that, um, that I worked with that ended up in Silicon Valley. Uh, they went there as technical writers because the engineers didn't know how to write. And, uh, and uh, they uh, ended up becoming involved in one way or another, and some of them ended up as venture capitalists. Uh, so, they're, they're, you know, it, 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 you, don't, you don't have to necessarily be an engineering major in order to uh, move into a high-tech field. No, but it helps. I'm going to give, uh, <laughs> not that I'm biased or anything. Uh, I'm going to give uh, Deborah the, the last word here. She's got something neat to t tell you about. Well, one of the things that the council um, has been working on is looking at the middle skills imperative for the country. And we did a, a very important report on this last year. And we have a huge deficit and shortage of middle skills workers. These are people that are highly trained. They have to have technical skills. They work in the complexity of nuclear power plants, high voltage lines. I mean, these are high paid jobs. They can't be outsourced. And our country is screaming for them. And many companies are actually making decisions of where they invest and where they go around this middle skills issue. And our research has shown in our work that there's a total misalignment between the $20 billion we spend on job training and the demands of industry. So our chairman, Chad Holliday, the CEO of DuPont, really drove us to come up with this fabulous recommendation, which we released on November 12th, for a compete pass. And what this would be is your new career is a click away to enable companies to identify what skills they need and then have people who want to get those skills get the resources in our existing training programs and you align it with the guarantee that when you get through that skill training DuPont or whoever will hire you for the job they need. So it's for the first time could link the skills training with the needs of our companies here in this country 
and use the existing resources we spend, which, you know, 20 billion out of labor is just the labor piece. There's a lot more at the state level in a way to give people jobs for the future. And so it's not, you know, the high end research we're talking about here, but it to drive our competitiveness in our economy. This middle skills opportunity is just huge imperative for us to act on. Bothers the, the jeebers out of me that we have done away with the technical high school, the vocational high school. Okay, Alan, do you have any word before lunch? No, I think this will we'll retire lunch now, or I think it's going, and then we'll be gathering here about one. Okay.